Welcome to episode 332 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. Your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I don't think I have uh, anything to share this morning. How about you? Anything going on? No, maybe just a quick reminder, though, that we have call for papers out for C on C and C now at the moment. So. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you're interested and in hoping that you'll be able to go to a conference in 2022, then I suggest you submit a talk to one of the open conferences. Yeah, hopefully uh, all those conferences can operate safely this year. Yeah, things are a little crazy right now, but hopefully. All right. Well, at the top of every episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we got this tweet from Matt Fernandez, uh, referring to last episode, saying, this was a great episode. Slobodan is one of the first C++ practitioners I've heard from in a long time who gets that modern C is a different beast from the 80s C and actually kind of good. And yeah, that was great talking to Slobodan. And it's interesting learning about some of the new modern C stuff because a lot of that was uh, was news to me. Right. Yeah. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cvpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Peter Winter. Peter started working as a C++ dev in 2005, working on a system Verilog compiler. Since 2010, he's been working for future processing in Poland. He's worked on many commercial projects since then, not always as a C++ developer. He had a minor detour as a full-stack.net web developer, which he did not like. <laughs> he was also an organizer of a 24-hour competitive programming marathon, Deadline 24, which was last held in 2018. And his main interest as a C++ developer was always compilers and parsers, which eventually led to the creation of CTPG. Peter, welcome to the show. Um, hello. Um, glad to be here. What what is the uh, deadline twenty four about? What was that? Yeah, that was really cool. So, um, future processing was. It, I think it started two thousand nine, so year before I even joined future processing. Um, it was local, like um, competitive programming marathon. It was always um, twenty four hours. So it was uh, three. It was a team of three members and three tasks. And you had 24 hours to do these um, tasks and no internet access. Yeah. Is it possible to program without internet access? Yeah, yes, <laughs> that's, yes. <laughs> Apparently it is. Um, uh, so, um, so first, um, it was a local thing. So like local, um, local college and um, participants and it turned out to be something really big um, with people like from Google and Yandex winning the competition. Oh, wow. um, the best algorithm um, experts from all over the world actually joining. And um, so it was kind of like, um, it was a victim of its own success, let's say, <laughs> because it cost, the cost are almost bigger than the benefits. Mm. It's hard to, it's like, at first it was um, um, supposed to like allow us to hire people that win these competitions, but then when Google guys win it, they won't be working in Poland, <laughs> right? So, mm. and it was um, really expensive from for the company to actually uh, prepare it. Um, it was just mainly because of our time, actually, because... The, the venues weren't the, like the big issue, but um, it was like offline. It wasn't the most interesting uh, location. The venue was actually underground mine, three, three, 300 meters underground. So oh, wow. no, inter no internet access was actually so, like... And that was chosen project. as a venue just to make sure you weren't like secretly looking at some code stack overflow post on your phone or something so. like that. I think, okay. I, I think this was just a cool location, but okay. yeah, that's the fact. Um, there just was no internet access period. <laughs> that's funny. Um, that so, sounds like fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, um, the tasks were actually, um, like you were supposed to code, uh, a program 
like let's we were writing like servers game servers and the programs were fighting with each other like mm. on an arena or um so something like that the tasks were um so heavily focused on all on algorithm algorithm and um <clears throat> yeah so but it's this is discontinued at the moment like so fun, though. so was everyone actually on site in that mine location during yeah, the competition it was 90 people 30 teams three people each wow it's pretty cool yeah it does sound like it could be cool all right well peter we got a couple uh news articles to discuss uh feel free to comment on any of these and we'll start talking about your uh ctpg project okay okay all right, so this first one is a uh, <laughs> poll on, on Reddit, which I thought was interesting. Um, do you prefer include guards or using pragma once? And I, I did get the uh, beautiful C++ book, and I haven't read through the whole thing yet, but uh, this was in the first chapter wow. where Guy and Kate uh, recommend using the include guards because it's standard, and even though pragma once might be available in all the modern compilers, uh, it's not standard. Uh, what do you two both think about this, though? I like Piotr go first. Sure. <laughs> I've never used Pragma once myself. I've seen it. <laughs> um, I don't know why, really. Probably because it's not standard, so I just didn't feel like it. And I, and I just thought that both do the same thing. So, So I would never use it, like, intentionally, but I didn't give it much thought actually maybe now i will <laughs> yeah. um i mean I the, the nice yeah, thing about pragma once is you can't make a mistake you can't you yeah, know accidentally can copy paste mistake. and include guard and, and not get the name quite right sure. or, yeah and i suppose the compiler can do a better job in terms of performance because the preprocessor needs to actually go through the file and seek for the end if right so it takes time Maybe. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I got the impression that it used to save time, but maybe doesn't anymore as our preprocessors have gotten better. But now I'm curious. Yeah. Well, for sure, the, the, yeah. if the guards can do at most as good as Pragma ones, there's no way you can do it better than Pragma there's, ones. Yeah. yeah. Right. Absolutely. I'd have to agree with that. Yeah, I've always been on the side of it's not standard, therefore I don't use it. Plus, I've read the arguments for why it's not standard, because while it saves you from making a mistake, the compiler could still make a mistake. Like if you include the same file two different ways, uh, the common example is like if you've got two different sub libraries that each include Zlib, but they have their own embedded Zlib, then you mm. might get Zlib included twice if it was both if they're using pragma once without include guards there. But mm -hmm. I mean, you probably have other problems in your code in the first and in, in that case as well. But there's a comment down here from Twim Thomas Swirly. It's at least half of the way through it. And Tom says, after reading this page, he's concluded that the only option is to actually use both. Really? <laughs> To save yourself from yourself and to save you from the compiler, you have to use both. Uh, <laughs> and then that's after reading all of the everyone else's arguments. Um, so this is why we can't have nice things, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And we, in which order? <laughs> uh, that's yeah. a good question. Would, would that make a difference? <laughs> it, it would definitely have to make a difference, right? Because if, if the pragma gets if deft out, then I don't know. I think you would want to put the pragma first. Yeah, anyhow. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, uh, next thing we have is a post on Arthur O'Dwyer's blog, and this is test an expression for const expert friendliness. And, you picked uh, a media one here, Rob. Well, and I, I thought this one would be good to, because of what we're going to be talking about in a few minutes with uh, with Peter. Um, testing for const expert. Um, but yeah, he's talking about this this test you can write to see if a function is, is const expert, but then also going into uh, how you can't do that for const eval 
functions, which was interesting. Yes, I think for this, for the sake of our listeners who, you know, can't see this code, it's <laughs> right. effectively using spin a to rule out an expression that cannot be evaluated at compile time. But the much more readable version of it is the uh, Joel Ernesto Guerrero Pena provides an alternative idiom using requires instead of spinne mm -hmm. and a requires expression. And so that one is more readable. If you scroll down to that one, you can say, oh, requires that this thing results in a, and, you know, that this thing is compilable. And the only way for it to comp be compilable is for the function that's passed in to be something that can be executed at con uh, context for context. And if it right. can't be, then the requires fails and you just get false back. Right. But uh, you know that version of it also still does not work in uh, const eval. Right. Yeah. And uh, the thing that he then goes on to talk about is that that seems to be intentional, that uh, you can't evaluate const eval. It's just always going to be compile time, and you're going to get errors if you try to use it otherwise. Right. Makes sense, actually. Yeah. Um, if we are forcing that this function should be compiled, time then it should just be an error right right and not just like sphina it's it makes sense I think. I think so yeah although i still sometimes wish that we had more ways of doing introspection you know into the code in a clean way of just asking is this something that could be run at compile time or whatever you know with with uh reflection kind of mechanisms that we don't currently have yeah, and it doesn't look like we're getting that in C plus plus twenty three, but you know, hopefully C++ maybe plus twenty six, twenty nine, yeah, <laughs> thirty two. Yeah, depends on when uh, they can start doing meetings again, I guess. Yeah. All right, and then the last thing we have is an update on uh, catch two, and this is actually. Is it catch two v three or is it going to be catch three? I don't know, but either way, it's it's the v three preview, fourth preview, um, and big list of you know what's changing, what some of the breaking changes are. Um, I didn't have a chance to read through this too much actually, so I was hoping one of you could uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, catch and what's coming in v three. I use it in CTPG version yeah. three specifically. Um, I tried. Okay. Yeah, but um, I had struggles, and it just reverted to version two. I had struggles because um, I was compiling. So catch two, this version three is a static library now, right. and it's not distributed as a binary artifact. Um, so I built it using GCC, and I was testing a Clang build of CTPG, like the unit tests, and it just segfault right away. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, and that's because. Um, catch two is using C++ interfaces under the hood. <laughs> so you have to build both catch and whatever test that you're writing with the same compiler and the same options, compilation options. And that's something that just the maintainer t told me on, on their Discord, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I just got back into using the version two. But because I was like, the whole point of it being now static library is uh, shorter compilation time. But I'm am I supposed to now compile it for each compiler and each compilation option separately, which sort mm. of defeats the purpose. But then mm. I thought that maybe not really. So maybe I'll give it another try. Because you are really building it once for each compiler, not for every, for each file that you write the tests, right? So if you have some sort of unit test project and you have like 10 CPP files with tests, you don't have to necessarily compile catch to 10 times, right? Right. For the t each file, you just do it once for the static library and then multiply it by the number of compiler options. 
So maybe it will actually save me some compilation time <coughs> in my GitHub action because I'm using it on the GitHub actions. Mm. Yeah, anyway, it's a um, cool idea. I was just going to say, Jason, it sounds like this kind of relates to you know the recent discussion we had with the two Bloomberg guys about distributing modules, right? Right. Yeah. I, uh, it also makes me think um, this is not dissimilar, it is similar to how I have how I use catch two in my own projects because you can do the uh, the pound define catch main or whatever. And uh, I actually build a static internal library once that has the catch main in it. And then I link to that in each of my in each of my catch tests. So I do save some compile time there. Um, so it might be a similar kind of setup with catch two version three that you would have to do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, Peter, could you start off by telling us uh, about the uh, CTPG project that you're working on? Yeah, the unfortunate name, <laughs> the acronym, and they just stole it from um, CTRE. So that's just keep <laughs> guilty. Okay. Um, the convention is totally stolen. Um, so it's compile time parser generator. Um, I mean, it's self-explanatory, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you want to have a parser. You define it using a grammar, sort of the same way you would do this using Bison and Flex. Like in theory, because we are using C++, so instead of the operators that are in the Bison syntax, you use C++ operators for this purpose. And um, yeah, and the compiler does the job for you and generates it a bunch of static arrays. So the, the, the parser is a const expert object with a, a a ton of like numbers and C arrays basically in it. Um, and then it has a parse method, which you use on a, on some buffer, whether it's runtime or compile time, you can actually uh, invoke the parse method of that parser in a context per like context. Um, yeah, so so that's basically it. So you you have like flex plus bison inside a C plus plus compiler. That's what it is. Actually, of course, it's um, it's nowhere near um, flex plus bison like feature wise because these are like for forty years projects and mine is two, and actually it released a month ago. So um, yeah, but. I'm looking forward to replace Bison. <laughs> <laughs> ah, joke. So you, you just said when you give it the grammar, the result is a static array with a bunch of numbers and letters in it, basically. Yep. So are you like building like a, a, a state machine or like a yeah like exactly a, yeah okay exactly a state machine for both lexical analyzer and the syntax analyzer. These are just two separate um, state machines. Um, the, the lexer is actually the, the, the finite state automaton. The parser is a bit more complicated. It's, uh, it has a st stack of states. Um, so, um, but it's still a state machine, but it has an operation to push and pop from the stack. Like, um, and yeah, it's so basically you'd have to look at the, um, the algorithm of the LR, par LR parser. Um, so I've actually used the, it from the book, like it was compilers design principles or something like that. The dragon book, mm -hmm. that one. I have it uh, mentioned on my GitHub. Um, okay. 
I'll see the algorithm. It's um, yeah, it's compilers, principles, techniques, and tools. Um, and the authors are um, Alfred Aho, uh, Ravi Sethi, and Jeffrey Ullman. It's a really old book. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I used it. Yeah, that's the one that our listeners might know of as the dragon book because it has right, a dragon right. on the cover. Yeah. Okay. So, so the the algorithm is um the, so the creation of a like the parse, parsing tables. So the algorithm itself is actually very. It's a complex in terms of like algorithm complexity. Um, so that that's why it was challenging to write it optimally, and in a context for con context in the same time. <clears throat> so uh, just to put it in the perspective, um, let's say a JSON grammar, and it takes like eight seconds to compile. I don't know if it's too much or not. Um, it depends like what you want to achieve. If you put that grammar in a separate compilation unit and don't change it much, then I think it's not a big deal. Right. But I like I was I I wouldn't use it for something like. Um, C grammar, maybe, just not yet. Um, I, I would need to like work on optimization a bit more first. But so anyway, I was, yeah, sorry, yeah, go on. I was wondering when you said you would work on optimization a bit more, I'm wondering, do you mean work on the optim compile time optimization or the runtime optimization? Or no, I'm not, right? Runtime is like blazing fast. So it's, um, it's a state machine. So it's, <clears throat> and there is no backtracking. It just reads each character exactly once and does a linear time um, parsing every time. So it's okay. no backtracking, no nothing like that. It cannot be actually faster, I think. You would like to. Um, so it's just you, if, you I will, read, uh, if I read you, this character, then jump to this state. If I read this yeah, character, jump to this just, state. Ba maybe basically, right. that's it, yeah. Um, so like the compilation time. Um, there are a couple of points I could improve um, algorithmi algorithmically. No. So in terms of, of the algorithm, yes. not really. That's like, um, you can do much there, but I have a couple of ideas. Uh, for instance, if you look at the, like, um, the page with C language and the operator operator pre precedence, right? And precedence of operators in C. And yes. you look at this table and you see that C ha um, the C language has like 11 assignment operators, which are basically the same. Um, they have the same um, precedence, the same associativity, like they are both, they are all, um, I believe, right associative. So you could treat them as, as as the same, basically. So not to complicate grammars, not to add rules, just add one. Um, do and do it like in a smarter way. So um, I've I've tried actually putting like the, exp the 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 grammar of the expression syntax from C language. And it was like too big. Um, the compiler ran out of resources. But the, the compilation time was not that issue. The big of a deal. I mean, it it went something something like a minute. I think it will compile it. But and I, I'm not using really powerful machine. I'm using a virtual machine for Linux work, mm -hmm. and I'm developing CTPG on Linux. So. Um, I would have to like increase maximum number of context per operations. There is appropriate switch in both GCC and, and Clang. <laughs> I don't know whether why this is the maximum. It's it looks arbitrary, but it does look arbitrary, yeah. Um it's not like a special number for me. Nothing really comes to mind. It's something like 33 million something. Right. So not sure why is that number so relevant. Anyway, um, when I increased it, and um, it still ran, ran out of RAM, so the compiler, and MSVC, like um, this thing is just eating RAM like crazy. <laughs> um, 
So even though it is supported in CTPG, just expect it takes RAM like at least five times, five times more than GCC and Clamp. Oh, wow. I, I don't know why. Context per operations in like the Microsoft compiler is um, much more RAM intensive. Um, in compilation time, they are pretty much similar. Um, yeah, so going back to the C grammar, I just put just the expressions, right? Just the operators, just this grammar. So I can like do a calculator that's similar with um, features that like the C operators have. And it was a bit too much. So I thought that, yeah, I, I could add some like, like a feature that will group um, similar operators in one group. So, so the grammar gets, gets less complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so the next challenge would be to actually reduce the, the size of the final parser. Um, right now, um, it can go up into the megabytes if you are using too much rules. That actual <laughs> static data table, the yeah, static like, yeah, array. It's okay. not a problem really, but um, the binary gets big. Mm -hmm. And it's very, and these arrays are really sparsely populated. So that's a way to optimize it, I think. Because so, um, mo most of the states are actually inaccessible. It will be <laughs> just an error. So I, mean, I didn't like do the optimization step on this this thing yet. So <laughs> there are so, there is a, a room for improvement, basically. Sure. Okay. So right now we're talking about like you know kind of. Uh crazy uh, edge cases, like putting in the, the C grammar. What are some of the more realistic um, things you've done with CTPG? Yeah, I've done um, JSON parsing, both runtime and compile time. So, so the talk you Jason gave about the context for all the things, that was actually the thing that inspired me to move into this direction, because originally I tried to do this um using meta programming and it it was just not usable <laughs> Wait, meta as as i can see yeah it's um too much ram consumption by the compiler and too much time so um so, so this tool was like not usable really for me so then i tried to move into the const expert realm and and it worked so the, the, I think the biggest thing I have in my examples is the JSON parser. Yeah, so it's really cool. It's uh, it compiles like in eight seconds, like I said on my machine, and um, and it can and and also there is this um, like compile time JSON version which you can do with CTPG using just two hundred lines of code. Wow. Yeah, so you can have like JSON constants in your C++ code. And I mean, the most tricky part was actually the representation of the JSON that can be const expert, uh, which is also right. what you face, right? Um, to solve it, it's... And I'm doing some trick that actually makes... Um, so you think if you think of a JSON, right? and you measure the number of characters it has, that's the maximum depth it can have, right? Okay. It's, it, it's overshoot really, but um, yeah, it's, you, you don't, you can't have um, like more depth than characters in JSON, right? And also you can have more than, more um, array elements than the characters and, and each of the um, objects cannot have more elements than there is characters in this JSON string. So I'm using this cap um, to statically like um, statically allocate. I mean, in compile time and allocate meaning um, just static array, right? Of this size mm -hmm. and just operate on in these terms. So I don't have to like parse the JSON string twice just to see what are the dimensions and depths and such. Right. Yeah. So. OK. 
Okay, so that's like beside the CTPG. That was um, the challenge that I faced you. So I can do the, the JSON parsing in compile time. Uh, so actually, and then, our, then there are like a couple of minor examples just showing off the, the features of the CTPG itself. It has like error recovery, for instance. So you can put a special token in your grammar saying that so you don't have to parse until the first error and then just stop. You can have like expected errors. Um, I think like the C++ parsers have it. So when it reaches like the semicolon, it dis disregards all of the syntax error before and um, and starts parsing again, right? So you can have multiple errors in the same compilation run. Okay. It doesn't stop on the first error, right? Um, you can have that in CTBG gen generated parsers too. You can have um, like operator precedence uh, specified um, and a couple of other, of other features. So um, just to compare it to Bison, let's say, the, so what Bison did was um, it, it took your grammar and then you wrote like the C, C++ code inside a, a Bison grammar and it was just copied into the generated code, right? Okay. So how I deal with this is because this is a C++ code, I'm using the actual like functors, right? The function objects and lambdas. So the syntax is constructed in such a way that after you write the rule for the grammar, you can associate with it some executable code, right? In the form of a function object being the whatever function object. You can put a function there or a lambda or some std bind or whatever would you. Um, yeah, so. So, so if you yeah. wanted to use a bind expression, mm -hmm. then you probably can't execute that grammar at compile time. Like I'm guessing there's some limitations if you want it to be a compile time executable grammar versus one that's runtime. Oh, well, yes. But um, if you use like a Lambda with a capture, so actually capture can be a reference that is not a const reference at all. You can modify things. Mm. So, okay. So, but like the, the parser to be the, the parser object needs to be a const expr object. So you can um, you can give it a lambda, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but if this lambda like modifies something in runtime, then of course it cannot be used as a context for parsing. Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And also, so the, the, the parser, um, so the, the result of, the, of this parser is some kind of value because all of the non-terminal symbols, just using the terminology from Bison, all of the non-terminal symbols in the grammar have a value type. So it's whatever C++ type. And, and so to use, um, to use the parser in a context per context, all the value types needs to be literal types. Um, right. Yeah. So if you, if you, yeah, so that's it basically. No, I mean, the literal type, I don't know if it's uh, in the standard, like, if the term is actually standardized, I think it's no longer, but I may be wrong. So the limitation is basically the, the types need to be default constructible and um, I think trivially destructible. Right. I don't know if the standard actually defines something like um, literal type. Yeah, I think they actually did remove that definition in C20 yeah. because of the weirdness of const expert destructors in C++ 20. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, so the limitation for the CTPG um, types um, is um, 
default constructible and trivially sorry and trivially destructible right so if you just adhere to this um concepts then um, you're fine just uh, parsing in in compile time yeah so you said that the json parser that you've written is blazingly fast but have you actually done like any kind of comparison to existing json parsers um not really just okay. I, I and i mean the, the runtime parser like the yes. usual one not the mm -hmm. not the contextual parser right one is of course uh, so the the runtime parser <clears throat> it is fast because it's, it's a state machine but i wasn't focused on um making it really fast so i'm using like standard containers like maps and vectors and okay and this is actually the most time it spends it is just allocating things right so if you, opt you first i would need to optimize that to actually make any comparisons and um well the obvious solution for that using is using pmr right yeah. so that will just um so I actually, I, it's a good idea. I, I think I could like try to um, compare it. I don't suppose it will be faster than something that's um, really uh, done just to be the fastest JSON parser, because that would be for sure handcrafted and written in C. Or um, I, I yeah. cannot be. I cannot beat that. <laughs> but does it have a hand rolled highly optimized state machine would be the question which i'm guessing people Maybe. don't do that that's an interesting so. question i need to <laughs> check it um how fast would it be but let's say it's like 80 percent like it's only 20 percent low slower but what you get in return is a, a json parser but you basically don't have to maintain and uh, because it's generated from from the grammar right so it's for sure um it's less error prone um it's going to have just less bugs um like um, i mean it's 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 better to define it as a grammar right than just handcraft the parser i suppose so the code base will be really small i mean i don't know what's um how many lines right now it has i can check just from my github page sure so um yeah so the json parser has um 292 lines and it just works and most Very of cool. the and most of the code is actually unicode um handling so you can um like Mm, uh, store Unicode strings in S to the strings. And I think it's like two thirds of this code. <laughs> and so it's like 100 lines to have a, a JSON parser that's not dealing with Unicode. Um, really cool. Yeah. I think that's a, an interesting thing that I so often have difficulty getting people to understand that there's so much that you can do at compile time and they think of compile time programming as metaprogramming. And you said you started this project as a metaprogramming project and said, this is pointless. And instead now you're, you're building a, a uh, state machine at compile time using just regular const expert, right? I just want- I mean, it, Yeah, it wasn't pointless. I had great time you doing it. A few because times, I, maybe. Yeah, I'm mean, just I'm when I'm looking like at complicated templates in C plus it just it warms my heart. But <laughs> um, yeah, but it was unusable. So I, it it worked. It actually worked. But um, anything like ten grammar rules and the compiler is out of heap. So. Uh, I just think this this concept of building a state machine or a jump table or whatever using normal programming techniques and then being able to replay that at runtime, generate it, compile time, replay it at runtime, it could have huge application for our listeners who maybe just haven't considered that before. It's, yeah, it's... And with the C++ 20, um like 
vectors and strings being const expert mm -hmm. it's a huge step i think um i wouldn't actually benefit from it <laughs> just because i am you, you can have a const expert std vector but you have to basically deallocate it before you go out of the you, it has to stay in the const expert context right yeah and i need to have the state machine there it's not like i can just calculate something and give back like a, a result and disregard the vector i need to actually calculate the vector so um i don't think i would benefit in ctbg from the std vector being con const expert so are, are you still on c17 then with this yeah memory? i don't intend okay. to change it just to make it like the audience a bit bigger because mm -hmm. not everyone can use um, bleeding, ble bleeding edge compilers. It runs on a, on a GCC 10. Okay. Uh, I think 10.2 and 10 and both and 10.3 is working. Okay. Clank is Clank 12, I think. Just because the const extra, even though it was in a like C plus plus 17, right? But it wasn't fully supported until most recent versions, and also the right. performance was lacking. There was there were some like um, compiler bugs if you try to do something in a context per context. So, yeah, that's um, yeah, a lot is is. Changed. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you say which version of Visual Studio is supported? Or um, I think it's 19.30. I mean okay. the compiler, right? Right. So I think it's the newest one, 2022. Okay. Before that, um, the const expert um, in the Microsoft's uh, compiler was um, just it was not working properly. There were such just just too many bugs and um, yeah. So I the, the the when I was using the Visual Studio twenty nineteen, it wasn't compiling. Now it does. We need to now push push for as much as we can push. Hope I guess that our compiler vendors start making compile time context for evaluation faster. Right, like. This would be a big win for a lot of projects if we could do yeah. more things at compile time with less pain. Exactly. So just to improve the performance of the compiler. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned that you're sticking with C++ 17 to make your audience bigger. Uh, then you said you don't think you would gain anything from constex per string, constex per vector. And, I've been spending time with that myself lately, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure either at the moment. But is there any other features from 20 or 23 that you would make use of that you, if you could? Um, I would benefit from STD variant going full const expert for sure. Okay. STD pair. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's in, it's it, in 20, it's full const expert, also the variant, right? Right. Because now I'm doing some strange hacks. Because for some reason, like the constructor is constexpr and the uh, assignment opera operator is not. Right. And uh, yeah, so um, so I'm using some strange hacks to just make it constexpr. Also, I believe the optional std optional. More constexpr. Also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it will just make a code a, a, a bit cleaner, I think, but nothing really breaking. Um, yeah, so. And the one thing I would need, yes, and uh, I'm actually doing the reg regex, right, in the CTPG. Oh. For the, for oh. the lexical analyzer. So I, I think it would benefit because you could have, um, I'm, you could have like um, so the regex gets its regular expression as a template parameter right so it's a string so in c plus plus 20 you can have it as a like string constant right 
in C++ 17, you need to have a static linkage object. So like, um, so I have this limitation, right? Uh, this would go away in C++ 20. You could use uh, an actual string constant there. You didn't have to define it elsewhere. And that's the same limitation that CTRE has, right? So if you're right. using C++ 17, then you need this um, static linkage, in so it can have, so, so it can be used. The string can be used as a template parameter. So, did you also yeah. implement your own regular expression library as part of CTPG? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I didn't implement it. I have CTPG, so I could write a regular expression parser using CTPG. So. And then use that inside yeah. of your CPTG. CPTG. Yeah. yeah, it's some sort of in inception thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly what I do. Actually, there is a grammar for the regular expressions inside the CTPG header, and um, um, it has a custom lexical analyzer because you you cannot use regex as yes to because. That would just be um, circular logic or something. So uh, I'm using I have I have, have just a parser for regular expressions, but um, the the lexical analyzer for regular expressions is a custom written one. But it's not complicated because it's just har character by character and just a couple of special characters in uh, regexes, and the rest of it is like treated literally. So yeah. we, we've mentioned Hana's CTRE library a few times. Have you compared your regex uh, you know, parser? Oh, to well, CTRE? It certainly it doesn't have the amount of features. Like <laughs> okay. This one is really basic. Mm -hmm. This is just a set of the subset of regex features that you would usually need for a, like your custom domain specific language, right? Okay. Or JSON. Um, there are no like obscure, um, all of the obscure, uh, regex features that are rarely used are just not, not imp implemented. I didn't just focus on them. It will, they will just unnecessarily complicate the grammar and just increase the compilation times for your actual grammars. So I, I think that's fine this way. Okay. And also, well, I think that that Hannah's library using is using the LL parser, right. and mine is L LR. So the LL is um, it's a top-down parser, right? And this LL stands for um, like uh, left to right and leftmost derivation, which an LL parser is uh, like bottom-up parser, and and it uses the rightmost derivation. So it basically um, tries to, uh, from the, from the leaves, like the terminal symbols, and it tries to, um, make a bigger concept, like for instance, um, so, so the bottom up parser goes like from the most specific, um, language terms, like the, the identifiers operators and so on into the higher level concepts right uh, whether this um the top down parser does the opposite so let's say it it basically parse me a class right that's what the, the top down parser would do and then it tries okay so it sees a, a header like say for a class and okay so i'm parsing a header now and then i see the identifier okay so and this one is the opposite. It, 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 that's why it's a state machine, right? Um, it, so the LR parser is, um, the down, the down term of using such a parser is the step of generating actually the, the state machine, which is time consuming. It's an algorithm. It has some complexity to it. Okay. But the final result is just a faster, a faster parser. And also the the grammars, uh, the set of grammars that you can give it is much bigger. You can have like um, left recurrence, for instance, which you cannot have in the LL parser. 
So you can define like expression as an expression plus sign and then another expression, right? You don't care that this is a reference. Other, other parser deals with it just fine. You and mm. so yeah, and no plus um the C theory uh, is this is actually the handcrafted parser for regular expressions, right? Whether the C and the CTPG is just a, it's a generator. You can have any kind of grammar, right? Not not um, the the regular expression grammar would be just an example. So I, I don't know a, a lot about parsers and and how grammars are defined. It's been a long time since I did any of that. Uh, but I'm curious, you mentioned Flex and Bison that came up earlier. Uh, you said yeah. you, you, of course, don't have nearly as many features as those. Yeah. But does it work in approximately the same way? Do they also generate a state machine internally? Yes. And they are also L LLR parsers or whatever like you're doing? Yes, okay. exactly. Bison can, you can specify what kind of algorithm you want at the output, the LR being actually the default, I think. And then you can specify that uh, you can specify several, I think, which okay. is mine. Mine is just LR. So it's um, it's the most powerful one, exactly. So um, yeah, and it basically does exactly the same thing. It generates a state machine. But yeah, but but like Bison does it actually just spitting out C, C or C++ code with a huge switch statement or something. And, Which is on the not, and not. the code of Bison is actually unreadable. Um, <laughs> or it, it was when I was using like it like 15 years ago. Um, yeah, but I'm not, that's not the point of generated code, right? It's, um, and what, I, I was using J, uh, Bison and Flex when I was starting my career as a software a system very very like compiler um, developer. So we were dealing with well, Flex and Bison, and because it, it was generated code and it was the early days of version control. Um, so. It was a pain because the generated code ended up in the repository. So if two people wanted to do something else inside the grammar, change it somehow, then uh, it was really hard mm. to maintain. So eventually we ended up having the grammar files in a repository and the generated code outside of the repository. But that has, has a drawback that you need a tool, like the Bison tool needs to be a part of your build system. Right. And it can be a pain too, because it was running on Linux, fine, on Windows, not so fine, <laughs> right? So we ended up porting Bison for Windows for our purposes. I believe it runs on Windows fine today. Yeah. Um, so we ended up each, so actually each, um, each automated build started by building Bison. <laughs> yeah. So you can imagine, so, and with CTPG, you just have a C++ compiler, right? And it just works. Of course, I wouldn't do, like I said, C grammar for, for with CTPG, but it's just a different approach. I, uh, Have you made use of CTPG in any like production projects or so far just yet. like the examples you have? Okay. Not yet, but I'm just judging by um, like GitHub issues. People are using it in oh, places. That's cool. It has like 20, 270 stars on GitHub right now. Oh, wow. And you um, said you just put it out like a month or two ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Some people um, on some universities use it just to teach parsers and <laughs> compilers because it has a really nice feature of diagnostic messages. So you can mm. see um, your parser as a, like a state machine and what, what is done on what terminal symbol and where are the conflicts. Um, 
yeah, and people just um, trying to adopt it somehow into their projects. Usually, probably, in, I mean, no one is uh, touching with me and um, and saying that they're using it in, in their commercial projects or so. It's MIT, so uh, licensing, yeah. so they can just do it. It has like nine forks already. Oh, wow. I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure. It's the first um, open source project of mine, and I'm not sure if it's if it's a big number or not. I don't have any comparison. I mean, Catch Two has several thousands. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like it's you know doing pretty well for something that's only been out for a short period of time. It's and since sure. November, end of no, end yeah. of November, so like a month. Well, it definitely sounds like listeners, uh, if they're interested in learning more about parsers and, and how parsers work, that this is a good project to go look at and play around with. Right? Yeah, I would love it. Some, I would love to hear from someone if he's trying to use it in his commercial project. In my experience, okay. you'll never learn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had people come up to me at conferences and say, oh, yeah, I've been using ChaiScript in my commercial project for the last five years. And I'm like, you could have told me sooner. <laughs> yeah. Would have been nice I to would, know. <laughs> it's not like I would charge you. I cannot. I can't. It's right. a, yeah, it's a but, BSD you know, license. If you want to have be a sponsor on yeah. GitHub <laughs> or something, I could use some money. That's right. GitHub <laughs> if you want some feature business. done, let's say, I wouldn't mind doing it. Yeah. It's it's a it's a project that I'm using doing in my spare time. So, of course, I'm. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, I definitely encourage all our listeners to go check it out. Um, and Peter, it's great talking to you. And thanks for telling us all about CTPG. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.